Hello. Hi. Yeah, so my name is Advait and I am a third year now PhD student at MIT working on systems biology. But my talk today, which I'm hoping will be short, my goal is to have this be more of a discussion rather than just me talking. So I'll just introduce what Alvina and I were working on. Alvina couldn't be here today, but we both worked on some ideas for sharing scientific research that goes beyond just the publication and paper model. So the way research is shared today, it's mostly publications. There are posters, talks, and other ways to share research, but papers are the currency by which the research world operates. And most of these papers are, well, it's changing now, but a lot of these papers are behind paywalls or inaccessible for other reasons. Like, I mean, I, I'm a third year PhD student and when I read a paper, it takes me a, a day at the very least to understand something. And this is probably not the best way to communicate science. So yeah, so we were thinking of other ways. And also another thing that matters is in this system, the incentives that researchers face aren't really aligned towards the best uh, research being produced because a lot of researchers are facing immense career pressure to publish high impact, splashy results. And that's not necessarily how science is advanced because negative results are important. And the fact that we don't see them today means that there's a lot of people who just keep doing the same experiments that were doomed to fail. That's just one example. There's also the reproducibility crisis where like one person does it and then no one else can replicate that. Uh, recently, there was the whole uh, Alzheimer's amyloid beta scandal, if y'all have been watching the news on that. So there's a lot of issues with how we have structured the system in which science operates today. Uh, before I move on to what we were proposing, there are preprints. So preprints are a great thing and they've been around for quite, quite a while in some disciplines. Like I think physics and math have done that for a very long time, but of late they've been, so I'm a biologist, so like I'm most familiar with that. And they've been really uh, exploding in the past few, in the past decade, I'd say. And especially with COVID, there's been a huge increase in those but they're still within the same publication model. They're like preprints, even the name is like before you publish it. And it's just still, it's a step in the right direction, but it's still got a lot of the issues with how like preprints are a finished product. But something that we're proposing is having some kind of GitHub-like model for science where you, work on things in public. If you have an idea, and an idea can come from anyone, it doesn't have to be just tenured faculty members at R1 institutions who have the best ideas. So anyone who has an idea, just posts it out there. And then people can run with this and anyone can work on this idea, develop it with feedback from public comments. And then funders, the place they come in is looking at mature ideas on this GitHub like platform that we're proposing. And then they find the best ideas to find. Or if there's some foundation that wants to create incentives to solve particular problems, then they just put out a call for specific ideas in, a, in their domain. But either way, all of this happens in the open. And then once a project gets funded, we're proposing that it still hap happens in the open, like any protocols, any data sets, any code, anything that comes out of it, you post it right away. And then the paper or the blog post or whatever comes at the very end, but it's not one packaged thing that you post after years of work, but rather something that's almost a natural I, it should have written itself based on what you have. So that's 
something that we're proposing. And uh, I'll quickly mention that several platforms for this exist. So there's OSF. This is one that we've been using for our own mini project. Now, this isn't exactly appropriate for what we're doing because this was more of a policy paper, but OSF is a platform that lets you have projects with several components and these components could be any of these. There's a couple new ones. I think research equals, I saw this two days ago, and this one lets you link ideas. So like, there's not a lot on here because they're really new, but here you could have an idea and then everything that goes off in this idea. So I could create a, whoops, I think I actually created something. Oh, well, it's fine. So I, I can create a module that bolts off of an existing idea, or I can look at other ideas that have both branched off from this. And then there's another one called Octopus. But I, there's a lot of these that are proliferating, but without the right incentives, they're not going to be taken up. So concretely, um, yeah, I guess I'll let you guys read the paper for like specific details on what we're proposing. But broad overview, we're suggesting that science funding agencies or governments or whoever's interested in this work together to create some kind of framework for a platform such as this so that there's some standardization. This would be, if you're familiar with open source software, this would be analogous to creating the Git equivalent for this, where they just have some kind of framework that then can have platforms built on top like GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever. And then also important is incentivizing these platforms by tracking contributions and using those for promotion and tenure review or funding grants, like I just mentioned. Um, yeah, I think that took a little longer than I had, but this is our preprint. I'll post the link in the chat, but please take a look and also to uh, be in the spirit of our own recommendations, we have, so OSF, has this hypothesis plugin on there. So if you click on it, you can go leave comments and we're hoping that anyone, if we don't talk about it now, y'all will be, you're, you're welcome to leave your comments there and we'll take a look at it. So, yeah. That is all I have, but happy to hear your thoughts and like any questions, ideas. I don't know how much longer we have. There's definitely time. There's a few minutes for questions. Thanks for sharing. So yeah, if anyone feel free to jump in if you have any questions or comments. Yeah, just ahead. a just oh, oh sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was curious what the incentives were still though. Right? Like I think you'd mentioned to change the way scientists and researchers are incentivized, but did we get into like, you know, those very human yeah. things like recognition or money or material thing, right? Like it's, I wouldn't just deny that those don't exist. Promotion, tenure, yeah. contributions, yeah, the grant. Yeah, so I guess it could be, a lot of this is inspired by our experience with GitHub. So again, I'm gonna go back to that. GitHub has this collab a contributions graph. That's just a heat map of how much you've contributed over time. And if you're, uh, I, I don't wanna spend time trying to pull that up right now, but something similar to that, where on this open source, open science platform, you can just find someone's profile and see all the contributions they've made. How many comments have they left? How many helpful peer reviews have they left? And instead of just having one H index or whatever, that's how many papers you've published, it's all of these outputs because reviews are important. And so, yeah, so that would be a metric that's provided. And then how these are used is by promotion and tenure committees or grant funders, because those are probably the places where we can actually, actually have an impact. Makes more sense. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Yeah, 
Go ahead. Uh, I have a question, uh, which I have a feeling is probably answered in this paper, but um, about the key bottlenecks in having this kind of more uh, utilized more widely in various fields. I imagine one of one source of pushback will probably be uh, older scientists who you know are kind of set in their ways. Do you think it would be easier to roll this out and make it more um, uh, more widely used if you first introduced it into things such as like uh, REUs and undergrad research labs first? Yeah, that's a really good idea. We hadn't specifically thought about undergrad labs, but that's probably a great place to start because start them young. Yeah, we propose starting this as a pilot program at some agency where it's just like a subset of grants that require this or like encourage this even, and then eventually broaden it until it becomes the norm. But yeah, starting with the undergrads is a really good idea. Great, There's so it looks like we're at time on this section, but it looks like uh, Richard has a really great question. And I wonder if maybe we could hold off until the Q&A section at the end and Richard will make note of your question. Um, but next, I wanna go ahead and pass it to CJ if you're ready to speak. Um, you're welcome to go ahead and take it away. If not, just let me know. Hi, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm still having a little bit of trouble um, with technology if it's, if it's possible, could I delay another presentation or two while I figure that out so I could get my slides working? Sure, um, yeah. Then I'll have to just do audio and I, it won't be quite as effective. Sure, yeah, that's no, that's no problem at all. Um, Chris, we'll just pass it to you um, to present Megan's presentation. Yeah, no problem. Um, so next we're gonna have one of our pre-recorded presentations as mentioned, this one is by um, Megan Foster, who is the program director and a research scientist at the McClear Center for Public Policy Research at the University of Idaho. Um, and they will be speaking about the Idaho Science and Technology Policy Fellowship and the NSPN Western Hub's newest chapter um, out in Idaho. So they have a pre-recorded video, which I'll share with y'all now. Hey everyone, I'm Megan Foster, Program Director and Research Scientist at the McClure Center for Public Policy Research at the University of Idaho. And this presentation will focus on the Idaho Science and Technology Fellowship, ISTPF, and the Idaho chapter of the National Science and Policy Network. The ISTPF is a nonpartisan program that connects science with policy by fostering a network of science, social science, and engineering leaders who understand government and policy making and are prepared to develop and implement solutions to address societal challenges. Fellow support decision makers in Idaho serving, serving year long assignments across state and government. Portfolios include topics such as water, energy, fire public health, economic development, and more. The fellowship program is similar to a program that started nearly 50 years ago by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, which places scientists and engineers and fellowships to support Congress, executive branch agencies, and the judiciary. Idaho is one of 22 states developing a science policy fellowship program at the state government level. The ISTPF is a collaborative effort among the University of Idaho, Boise State University, and Idaho State University. The McClure Center for Public Policy Research at the University of Idaho serves as the lead for this program. An advisory board of public and private sector leaders um, provides support as well. So ISTP fellows hold a doctoral level science or social science degree or a master's in engineering with at least three years of work experience. Fellows can be at any stage in their career and they have diverse backgrounds and professional experience holding postdoctoral fellowships. Um, they could be faculty members or have more research centered careers or they could have kind of recently changed careers or found new interests. Um, the fellows need to have some sort of connection to Idaho. They could have studied here, um, worked here for a bit, or even grown up in Idaho. 
The ISTPF's uh, first cohort began in August of 2020. In addition to joining host offices, the fellows also attend a week of orientation. Orientation provides an opportunity to learn about science policy, the history of science and technology policy in the US, how policy works in federal government, public policy analysis, the three branches of government in Idaho, science policy communications, um, and for more kind of local and national uh, experts. There are also monthly professional develop, uh, development seminars and certain aspects of the orientation and these seminars are open to others, including um, NSPN members. So the ISTPF's uh, third cohort will begin um, this August and with placements in both the executive and legislative branches. This year features the inaugural placement of a fellow in the Legislative Services Office. And placements of ISTP fellows have included the Idaho STEM Action Center, the Governor's Office of Species and Conservation, the Governor's Office of Energy and Mineral Resources, and the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. So the California Council on Science and Technology, in partnership with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the Simmons Foundation, provided startup funding for the ISTPF. The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Center for Advanced Energy Studies, CASE, here, um, and the individual con contributions enabled this launch of the first cohort. Uh, the Idaho National Laboratory on behalf of Battelle Energy Alliance, Idaho STEM Action Center, Micron Foundation, Power Engineers, Boise State University, Idaho State University, University of Idaho, and individual contributors helped to support the second cohort. And funding from the Betty, uh, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation enabled ISTPF to um, expand its placement opportunities this year to include Idaho's Legislative Services Office. So the Idaho chapter of the National Science Policy Network launched in 2021. The chapter is statewide, so we welcome members from universities, the Idaho Academy of Science and Engineering, interested professionals, um, even Washington State University as it's close proximity to Idaho and the University of Idaho. Um, we've had one social event that take, took place uh, last year during ISTPF orientation. And the faculty advisor for the Idaho chapter is Dr. Katherine Hines, the director of the McClure Center for Public Policy Research at the University of Idaho. And we're really wanting to kind of foster a science and policy ecosystem in Idaho and see this NSPN chapter is really helping to help kind of build that ecosystem. So we are seeking new members um, and those to serve in leadership roles as well for the chapter. So please reach out to us if you are interested. Um, we have an email address on the next slide where you can, of course, reach us at. Um, so I'll move to that. So if you are interested in learning more about the Idaho Science and Technology Policy Fellowship, we have a web page as well as the Twitter account. Um, through the Twitter account, we do post kind of those webinars and things that you're able to join. Um, and also, I'm so, sorry we couldn't really be here live to present, but we are happy to talk one-on-one -on -one if you have any questions. So uh, please feel free to reach out to the email address provided. Um, and then additionally, the ISTPF orientation will take place at the end of August with some uh, virtual training options. So please reach out if you would like an invitation to those or follow us on Twitter to kind of keep an eye out for when those things will occur. Um, so happy to take any questions via email. Thank you. All right, so yeah, feel free to get in touch with Megan if you have any questions. And next, uh, we're gonna pass it to Ryan, who is gonna talk about understanding the threat of biological weapons in a world with COVID-19. So Ryan, if you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Cool. I can't though, so I'm gonna fix this for a second here. Um, good enough. Right. All right. Sorry. Um, yeah. Hi everyone. My name's Ryan. Um, I finished my PhD last year in immunology at the University of Chicago. Um, I'm currently a. Let me get the timer going so I don't run over. 
I'm currently a scientist at a company called Alvia. Um, and we're working on a DNA vaccine platform so that we can more rapidly distribute uh, vaccines to low and middle income countries. Um, but I did spend the last three months working as a visiting biosecurity fellow at the Council on Strategic Risks, uh, which is a think tank in which, uh, and uh, along with the CSR, I co-authored this report um, that I will talk about today. Um, so very briefly, the Council on Strategic Risks is a think tank that is dedicated to anticipating, analyzing, and addressing core systemic risks to security in the 21st century. Um, and they primarily focus on three uh, cause areas, uh, climate security, nuclear security, and biosecurity. And interestingly, I think, uh, they primarily focus on catastrophic risks. Um, so each of these areas, well, nuclear security is pretty much always catastrophic, but each of the three areas, ha uh, the other two areas have, you know, varying degrees of, of risk associated with them. But the Council on Strategic Risks focuses on the catastrophic level that could potentially um, do significant damage, damage to uh, like Earth level society. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this report, um, the goal of this report was to discover uh, if the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to increase, decrease, or not affect potential malicious actors' inclination to develop and use biological weapons. Um, and when I say malicious actors, it primarily was focusing on state-level actors um, and not independent or um, individual-level actors. Um, and so it was a, I'm going to just very cover, briefly cover, I think I have three more slides, um, three parts of the report. The first part was to survey, uh, is a survey of dozens of governmental and non-governmental officials for their thoughts on the history and uh, motivations behind biological weapons programs. And this was not my idea, but I think it was a genius idea because it enabled us to survey individuals with um, security clearance um, for their perspectives on uh, biological weapons and release that in a public report. So the report is informed by confidential um, and classified information, but the report is publicly available um, itself. And the second part of the report is an outline of three potential future scenarios. One is basically the worst case scenario in which biological weapons become a significant component of deterrence between nations. That would be very bad and high risk for uh, humanity. The second scenario is a best case scenario in which biological threats hasten a new era of international cooperation. It is the uh, ideal scenario, but very unfortunately unlikely to occur. And then the third scenario is the uh, is a hybrid world of ambiguous threats in which uh, biological weapons and uh, programs persists. Um, this is unsurprisingly and unfortunately the most likely scenario I think that we are headed on. Um, and the third part of the report is uh, translating lessons from these interviews and surveys into strengthened U.S. policy ideas for countering biological threats. Um, so super briefly, I wanted to show just a couple interesting parts of the report. This is a bit of the survey that you cannot read, but I will cover <laughs> the um, brief parts, uh, the important parts, I guess. Um, this is showing the top motivations for biological weapons programs through the decades. Um, and the primary thing you can notice is the change in color of the top motivating factor between the like, 50s and 70s and the current era um, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so basically what happened is that states have appeared to lose interest they were primarily interested in the original days of biological weapons programs and their battlefield utility um, and biological weapons as a, as a potential yeah, battlefield application. But in recent years, the top motivating factors, number one and two in each of the last three decades, has been their use for hybrid warfare, regime security, and assassination attempts. Um, so this is a very different application of biological weapons that um, countries are, are interested in. Um, and that should motivate and inform policy uh, to counter those these potential uses. Um, and the last bit of data here is showing a survey of the top inhibitors for biologic weapons over the years. Um, and again, there's been a serious and significant shift in the top inhibitors. So the original inhibitors were primarily the difficulty of containment, uh, the fear of blowback, um, and the lack of control over biological weapons compared to conventional weapons. Um, and the uncertainty of efficacy, and, and it is difficult to use them um, effectively. Uh, but the new top inhibitors, I think, is a really important thing to highlight, is the fear of retaliation and legal and moral constraints. And um, it's it's good that people, uh, that nations are worried about legal and moral constraints, but that's also, I think I'd, I'd like to point out that that's also a very delicate situation and that the uh, norms around weapons usage can change on a dime. And so I think that's a particularly fragile Mo, uh, inhibitor that should be taken into account. Um, and so I'm going to skip over part two of the report and I'll share the full report in a second. But the part three is the lessons learned and there were more lessons learned and they go in much deeper than this. But just briefly, I wanted to talk about 
uh, the number one uh, recommendation is that the government should continue support for pandemic prevention and near-term successes in bioweapons prevention, which sounds like the most obvious and non-statement statement there could be, but um, it's actually not as obvious as you might hope for. Um, because uh, number two, the fact that international collaboration is going to be key in any biological weapon prevention. And these are two uh, situations, I think, in which the United States is, is not continuing support uh, in the way that it should be for pandemic and uh, biological weapons prevention. Um, and the first example of this is the Biological Weapons Convention, the BWC. The review conference is later this year. Um, and the BWC, at is its current in its current uh, state, it's been around for about 50 years and it's relatively toothless. Um, and so strengthening would be fantastic, but even maintaining it at this point might be difficult because while a lot of states were mm, heading into the review conference this year with optimism that the COVID-19 pandemic would motivate uh, countries to increase uh, international norms, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine and started accusing the United States of funding biological weapons programs in Ukraine, that's pretty much dashed all hopes for progress at the BWC. And now the biggest question is whether or not at this BWC RevCon, the most important thing is that they schedule the next RevCon, at least within five years from now. And without that, if that doesn't get scheduled, um, if Russia doesn't agree to schedule another one, the BWC is basically de facto like defunct, which would be, um, I think, pretty catastrophic. Um, so hopefully, so you can just schedule another meeting five years from now. That would be like uh, a win, sadly. Um, and second is the Biological Threat Reduction Program, which is a key internationally cooperative program to capacity build in other nations around biological defenses, um, has been losing funding every year, even through the pandemic, um, which I think is, is I'd say, mind-blowing, um, how that's not, uh, does not have increased funding. And additional, uh, the Apollo report is another report that I'll share, I guess, in a second, but um, this was a report um, uh, commissioned by Congress and was part of the argument for Biden's $65 billion pandemic uh, preparedness uh, program, which has so far funded, resulted in exactly zero dollars of funding. Um, so this is, you know, three pretty alarming factors that I think um, would be great to turn around. Um, I won't talk about for the sake of time the third factor here, but um, that's the gist. I will share the report in a second, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are some or talk about this more later offline. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for your presentation. We've got a few minutes for questions. So if anyone has any, please feel free to, or if you want more private discussion, then we can do so in breakout rooms later. So yeah, I'll give it a few minutes to see if anyone responds. Oh, looks like Richard has a statement. All right, I'm just gonna run through this. Why would states have interest in biological weapons for battlefield activity? Um, I mean, this was, we're talking like 50s and 70s when that was the primary motivating factor. So it was a long time ago and um, people were sadly trying to kill each other in the most effective way they can. Um, and so they, uh, there were a lot of nations, including the United States originally that had biological weapons programs. Um, and for a variety of reasons, they never panned out as a, a battlefield uh, weapon, which I think is, is good. Um, how does this differ from state versus federal? Uh, broadly, there's very little state funding for biological weapon prevention. There's a lot of public health and pandemic preparedness, of course, on state level, which doesn't fully overlap with uh, biological weapons prevention, but does to some degree. Um, and I think California might be one of the only states that has really even had some level of discussion around that. Um, so there's a pretty big difference, I think, state versus federal. And right now the Department of Defense is one of the largest funders and, and providers of biological bio defense. Um, but even with the, within the Department of Defense, it's very kind of, I don't know what the professional word for poo-pooed is, uh, <laughs> and it's not like a widely uh, respected or um, uh, funded cause area within the Department of Defense, which I'd say is bad. Um, and CSR itself is working on, on remedying that. Um, and I can keep going, but cut me off, I'm running out of time. Um, do I think U.S. policy for countering biological threats will be more likely will be more likely thanks to the new smallpox epidemic. Um, I don't know, you'd think that the COVID-19 pandemic causing trillions of dollars in worldwide damage would provide a pretty significant motivating factor for pandemic preparedness and countering biological threats, and it hasn't seemed to have the effect that people would hope. So I don't think monkeypox is going to add to that to a huge degree, um, but I hope I'm wrong. 
Uh, finally, there's a lot of discussion with defense agencies, but should there be collaborations to health organizations to CDC, like such as the CDC, to help assist in the matter? Absolutely. Um, the CDC has like a new forecasting uh, division or department, uh, which I think is really great. And yeah, there absolutely needs to be like intense uh, collaboration between public health and biodefense. Um, CSR's recommendation is that the United States should fund $10 million for public health and $10 million for biodefense each uh, per year each for the next 10 years. Um, that's what they think is it's going to take to solve the problem. Um, yeah. There's another question in the chat. I'm just going to, should I go? Should I pause? How am I doing? <laughs> Yeah, um, I'd say one more minute's fine. All right, final question. Are you familiar with other countries changing their behavior after COVID to fund biodefense? Um, I mean, I'm certain there's many examples of changes. There's a, a difference there between changes and effective changes. Um, and I am just going to, I guess, pan not panic, but like not be able to think of something off the top of my head, real brain freeze here. But um, I know in discussions with the, the, with the BWC, for example, um, the United States funds, its funding is very minimal and a lot of states fund the BWC on the order of like literally 75 to hundred dollars. Like it's, it's incredible how little funding they're provided with. And, uh, they've gone to a lot of countries like, Hey, would you want to give us like 20 extra bucks? And they're like, no, absolutely not. Um, and so I think that's pretty, uh, <laughs> discouraging, um, when it's like, you know, <laughs> literally on the order of hundreds of dollars and people can't increase the funding. And then no country will allow private funders or um, certain countries to increase their funding of the BWC because then of course, that of course threatens other countries. You know, if the United States funds more, Russia's mad. If Russia funds more, the United States is mad. If a private donor tries to contribute more money, everyone's mad. Um, so right now, the only way the BWC can really uh, uh, allow any donations or increased funding is through like interns. So people can like fund an intern to work there for three months and accomplish very little. But if you want to intern at the BWC, give it a give a shot. <laughs> it's got a full time staff of three people. It's very underfunded. Um, so that's an example of how people have not changed their behavior. So I did not answer your question, but that's what I got. Thanks so much for your presentation. Really appreciate it. And no uh, I, I'm sure there's some more comments and questions. Um, so if anybody has any, please feel free to hang on to them and we can get them addressed at the end. Uh, and CJ, are you ready? Is this a good time for you to go? I hope so. Great. Okay, well, let's give it a try. Um, yeah. So CJ is going to discuss the assessment of information used in Arizona legislative technology committees. Uh, CJ, go right ahead. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much for this opportunity. I am very grateful to be here. Um, I am starting my second career. So I, I spent uh, 19 years in R&D in uh, pharmaceutical and um, medical device development. And now I'm going to law school. So what I'm going to be presenting to you today is a bit of research that I did uh, in law school that is looking at how information legislative committees or how Arizona legislative committees use the information that is presented to them. Big takeaway for me was uh, that I figured out that it's okay to lie to Arizona legislative committees. And um, I don't know, but I suspect that this is not unique to Arizona. Arizona has no actual requirement for truthful or even reliable committee testimony or information. So this is very much unlike the court system where I'm sure everybody is um, used to seeing people swear and they said, tell the truth, the whole truth. And, and um, people have to actually testify based off of personal experience or their expertise and none of those requirements exist when we give information to uh, legislative committees at least in the the committee process itself and uh, there's at least one other state uh, where the where a same situation is so um, please consider the information that I'm about to show you as perhaps a case study um, this whole area is uh, really not studied as far as I am able to tell. 
So uh, one of my goals today is to try to convince other people to look into their own states and see if it's if perhaps there's a similar situation there, because state law is actually really impactful to people's everyday lives. lives. And it's my proposition that law should be based on facts and those facts should be reliable. So what I did is I looked at two years uh, in three committees of the Arizona House and Senate. So that spanned about 92 meetings. Uh, and those years were pre-COVID because I didn't want any kind of uh, COVID weirdness in my data. So I looked at uh, the three committees that I thought had the best chance of having some sort of science-based information presented to them. So that was health, transportation, technology. And then I reviewed all of the attachments that were in the minutes for the House and Senate committee uh, meetings. And then I classified those attachments. And then I looked at every attachment and figured out what the citations were, if there were any in those attachments, classified all of those and did a source assessment. I also followed up with some video review. I'm not going to go into to any of that, but just to confirm that what I was seeing was you know, in the right ballpark or if I was totally way off base just by looking at the minutes. What I found is that in general, and, and maybe you'll be surprised by this, um, I was surprised that legislators don't get a whole lot of peer reviewed information. Uh, in fact, fewer than 5% of the attachments that uh, were in those committee meeting minutes were actually from peer reviewed sources. The biggest source of information that is provided was actually a personal letter. So um, it's just that that would be a letter from a constituent that they had sent to their legislator. And most of those, in fact, were um, groups that the, legislate, the legislator themselves either formed or uh, solicited So uh, in order to influence the votes in their committees. It was also very difficult to assess a number of the sources. And I have a, a, just a picture here of one of the reasons why. In this particular instance, it was a journal article that was submitted to the committee, but I highlighted here that we've got uh, 107 citations in this article and only three of them were actually included with the um, with the article. So as you know, without the source, it's very difficult to assess the reliability of information. And very often, <clears throat> excuse me, those sources would just be cut off and, and omitted. So if we don't have any sources, we can't really tell how reliable that information is. Most of the attachments themselves had absolutely zero citations. So there was no way to assess how well or how reliable that information was. Uh, but there were also a number of outliers where uh, 10 of those attachments accounted for a thousand of the citations that I assessed. So in the next slide, you'll see the assessment of the citations and there, there's gonna be some heavy influences from just a few of the attachments. So this is an assessment of the citations that were used in each one of those committee meetings. And I was heartened to see that uh, subscription journals, which I would consider to be a reliable source and because of the peer review uh, associated with those, uh, was actually the number one thing that was cited in those, uh, in the citations that actually existed in the attachments. However, uh, there was a, a a number, if you add it, for instance, web links and unreviewed studies together, that's actually a larger number of the citations um, that people used to give some credence to the information that they were pre uh, presenting to uh, legislators. Um, now, I do want to just pause really quick and say um, legislators use a lot of different types of sources of information for what they um, base their decision on, and this is just one. Uh, but it's really the only place where the public can provide information. But again, anybody can say anything in these uh, committee meetings, and they, in fact, do. Uh, it's really, really difficult for the legislators to know what to rely on because we just don't give them that information. Their information burden is really high. 
technical writing from a journal is very unfamiliar, full of jargon, is probably not super useful to those legislators. So I'm not saying that peer-reviewed information is necessarily the way to go. And even with that type of citation, uh, with the um, open access journals and um, and predatory journals, it may even be difficult to see a journal citation and for the legislator to know if that's really reliable or not. What I did find though that was a, a little bit more concerning to me is that evidence was really uh, presented out of context and therefore biased. So there might be a source that was actually very uh, credible, for instance, a list of ingredients of vaccines from the FDA website but it was presented in the midst of an anti-vaccine presentation. And so it's not really clear how that information was tried to be used. Was it a scare tactic because they were full of chemical names and oh my goodness. So um, in that situation, very high and very low reliability sources were mixed together, giving more credence to those low reliability sources. So there's a, a challenge with the evidence in that situation as well. So just wrapping up, um, I hope that what you come away with is that uh, information reliability in state legislator, legislatures is very important. Uh, it's not really well studied and we have a lot of opportunities to improve the types of information that our legislators get. And uh, it's my hope that maybe some of you would be inspired to start looking at your own state legislatures. Thank you. I am open for questions, so I'm gonna just stop my screen share. Yeah, it looks like we've got a couple minutes. So if anyone has a question, please feel free. I see Chris has his hand up. I was just applauding, but I will take advantage of that because I do have a question. Um, I was kind of curious, and I think you touched on this in one of your last slides, and that when I've heard about you know advocating to policymakers, you're often told not to you know give them the peer-reviewed journal articles and not kind of that heavy data analysis. Do you, so do you think in some ways that this is self-selecting, like folks are kind of self-selecting themselves out, um, even when they're kind of credible? Um, to make the information more accessible and the hope that just gets read at all um, in some ways. And then as a kind of follow up to that, did your did you notice any trends in terms of the what I guess what lawmakers are perceiving as the most reliable? Like does it help to have um, place does it help to have bodies like in California, I'm just thinking like um, the Council on Science, California Council on Science and Technology, like known bodies that are kind of more trusted um, to kind of give a comment, do those have higher weight? Or is there any kind of weight in place on the different sources in case you have? Okay, so, so I'll take those in order. Uh, the first question was, um, do people self-select out in order to make their information more uh, understandable? And quite possibly, yes. However, I don't think that's an excuse for completely omitting any kind of citation to a relevant uh, and reliable source. So, um, you know, maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe there's some studies, but um, you know, when I'm going back and looking to see what the information that my legislators used in order to decide to, uh, for for example, uh, omit requirements for people for parents to vaccinate their children, um, I want to know that they're getting reliable information. And so the only way for me as a constituent to know that is to look back at those sources. So I want to see that. Um, maybe it's not important to other people. And certainly that's a conversation that we can have, but it was important to me as a scientist. So the second question, um, can you restate that one? Sorry, I lost it. Yeah, no, it's a bit convoluted. Um, but I guess in the kind of the trends and the types of kind of reports or comments and stuff that people were, did you notice any that stood out in terms of non-personal that seemed to have more weight or kind of were more frequent? Um, like what other non-personal non type of information where are folks getting their sources from, policymakers getting their info from? So one thing that, that stood out for me and actually came from the video review, um, 
well, there were two things. So one thing was uh, in order to make things more reliable, they should at least associate the person that said it to the information. And now that, that happened a lot where the person who presented that information was completely dissociated from that information. So there was zero way to go back to any kind of source or even ask the person who presented it. So that was number one, and it, that should be a really easy fix. Um, but the other thing was, uh, I would notice when I did the video review that um, the legislators would defer to people they call experts and they would have them come up and testify. And so this wouldn't make it into the minutes necessarily. Um, and then those experts would start spouting off statistics and blah, blah, blah. And, but there's actually, no citation at all or about where those statistics came from. They just kind of pulled numbers as far as I could tell out of the air. And that was not infrequent. And, uh, you know, the person's um, actual expertise, would that stand up? I don't know, um, because there's really no standards, right? There was absolutely zero um, oath requirement. So they could have just been you know, saying whatever they wanted to. So uh, I think that there should be a consequence to presenting false or misleading information. And there is not, as far as I'm able to tell. And there are a bunch of things in the chat. Should I go through those or? Um, we won't have enough time, unfortunately, but I would say we'll definitely have time at the end. So if Zoe, I think it was you and Wataru want to wait until the end, then we'll get the questions answered if you're okay with sticking around CJ. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and next, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Wataru. Uh, sure, yeah, thank you. So I'm presenting on... Uh, the GoFast report for Fusion Day 2022, and I'll explain a little bit about what that is. Uh, I'm Wataru Hayashi, uh, a member of GoFast, and I'm joined by a fellow member of Dionisi. Uh, I'm a PhD student in plasma physics at uh, UCI, and Dionisi is a PhD student in electrical engineering at UW-Madison. So to kind of go over what GoFast is first, uh, and actually to provide a quick outline of what I'm gonna go over. So I'll go cover GoFast, uh, give a crash course on fusion energy and then explain Fusion Day itself. So GoFast stands for Graduates Organizing Fusion Advancement for a Sustainable Tomorrow. It's a national network of graduate students and early career scientists who are involved in fusion energy research at all stages. And it was started last year by Andrew Maris, who's a PhD student at MIT, and Adam Rutkowski, who's a PhD student at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Our organization is managed entirely by graduate students and early career scientists, and we work on organizing public and legislative engagement. So an example of that is Fusion Day, which I'll talk about, as well as uh, hosting forums, uh, which uh, Dionisi will be doing actually at UW-Madison for their IEEE chapter uh, next week, I believe. So now I'll cover a little bit about fusion energies just to uh, explain um, or for us to understand why we're doing fusion day. So fusion energy uh, happens when you have a fusion reaction between two lighter particles. Uh, they'll release a bunch of energy and they'll also kick out um, a new heavier particle. And so if you see this chain of fusion reactions here, this is actually the chain of reactions that powers the sun. And uh, so the sun, you know, it spits out a lot of this fusion energy. So we know that it's a good source of energy, so much so that in comparison to coal, fusion reactions, at least the common ones that we study here on Earth, uh, can spit out uh, up to 10 million times more uh, energy per mass than coal does. So we know energy. Uh, fusion energy is very efficient. Of course, we know that it can come from the sun, uh, but here on Earth, we study it uh, in a few different ways. So one of them is inertial confinement fusion. Uh, so one example of that is the National Ignition Facility in Lawrence Livermore, pictured here, where they use lasers to basically compress a fuel pellet. Uh, but another way of doing it is with magnetic confinement fusion. So that's where you have a device such as this, uh, where they have magnetic coils that shape and compress a plasma uh, and squeeze it out 
to basically create fusion. And so examples of this are D3D in San Diego, uh, Spark at MIT, and Eater, which is pictured here. It's an international collaboration uh, being built in France between uh, the European Union, the US, Japan, uh, France, obviously, uh, and a host of other countries. And in fact, the central solenoid, which is a big stack that goes in the center here, is currently under construction uh, in San Diego at D2D. Uh, and then this is what Dionysi and I actually do research on. Uh, not this device specifically, but we do research on another class of uh, magnetic confinement fusion devices called stellarators. So we know that fusion energy is a very efficient energy source that is possible of gener generating massive amounts of energy, and we can we could feasibly harness that energy uh, and blow away most uh, well all fossil fuels. So now on to Fusion Day itself. So what is Fusion Day? Fusion Day is an annual event collectively organized by research institutions across the country. Uh, this year is held in uh, at the end of March. And the goal is to meet with members of Congress to request support for fusion energy research. And so the people meeting with these members of Congress, they can be staff scientists and professors, uh, but better than that, it can also be a students. Um, and so usually the Fusion Day organizers, they will focus on states with major research institutions. So that's like California, uh, New Jersey, which houses Princeton, Massachusetts. Uh, but we decided to focus on states that received less attention. So we looked at Hawaii, Pennsylvania, Colorado, Florida, Ohio, Rhode Island, and then we also had California in there as well. Uh, and the reason for this is because uh, the constituents in those states, which um, we pick those because we are those constituents, we're interested in fusion energy despite being from uh, states that might not host large scale research institutions. So GoFast was able to kind of have more flexibility than the main uh, organizers behind Fusion Day itself. So this year, part of our asks for Fusion Day, uh, when we met with the delegations, uh, the first one was to support the America Competes Act of 2022. Uh, this contained uh, the DOE Science for the Future Act, which was originally passed in the House. And the For the Future Act actually outlined $8.8 .8 billion in funding to the DOE Office of Science, along with 1.003 billion for the Fusion Energy Sciences Program. So uh, these are continuations of funding programs that they've run through the years, but we always like to make sure that we can go back and uh, continue to get their support on this. The second thing was uh, for the members of the the members of Congress to sign these dear colleague letters that were circulated in, in both houses. Uh, and in the lower house, uh, we also requested that they join the Fusion Energy, Energy Caucus. Now in preparation for Fusion Day, uh, we would host weekly GoFast meetings roughly 10 weeks in advance. Uh, during these meetings, we would compile profiles on the members of Congress that we plan on meeting with. Uh, so here's an example of the profile I compiled for Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii. We also compiled these leave behind pamphlets, which were basically one page summaries of everything we're asking for or why we're asking for it. And then we arranged meeting with these delegations. Now, usually uh, we're unable to meet with the member themselves. We're usually meeting with a science or energy policy advisor. Uh, this is where the benefit of having students comes in. Usually your science or energy policy advisor uh, is someone who uh, I would say younger side doesn't really mesh well with uh, the scientists and the professors who wanna just lecture them. Uh, and so working with students has uh, been a big benefit for them. In preparation or our final preparation for Fusion Day, we met with the organizers of Fusion Day itself uh, to coordinate our efforts with them and then to practice our pitches. So this is just a thanks to Julie, Arturo and Aaron. So I'm just gonna go over one specific case, uh, which was my meeting with representative Sci uh, Brian Schatz from Hawaii. I met with James Chang, who's a science and technology policy advisor. During the meeting, he explained to me that the Competes Act, which I had talked about before, was actually rewritten into the United States Innovation and Competition Act of 2021, or USICA. Uh, it was rewritten three days before Fusion Day, so we actually went in there somewhat blind. The problem with USICA is that it completely removed all the wording from the For the Future Act, and so it removed all the funding uh, that was originally outlined. 
So uh, after they rewrote it, Yusika was sent to the lower house, and this triggered this process uh, in order to resolve differences where they would try to agree on the different wording. Uh, so on the fly, we had to change our original asks to basically, can you keep the original wording in Yusika when you when both houses come to agreement? And so after Fusion Day, we're wondering, did it work? Uh, well, if you've been following the news, if you've seen anything about the CHIPS Act that was just passed and is sitting on uh, President Biden's desk, essentially, it has the For the Future Act written into it. Uh, and it actually includes $100 million added to the original funding request. Um, we can't really say that we're responsible for it, but I like to think we are, uh, me talking to one science policy advisor. Uh, but that was it for the Fusion Day report. And I think these questions I'll leave for later. Great, yeah. And if anyone has one quick question, we could do that. But if not, uh, we could just wait till the end. Um, so if anyone does, please feel free to go ahead. But we are running a bit behind. So um, yeah, if you have something quick, if not, we can spend more time at the end. If no one has a question, I have a question for everyone else. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. If um, we're wondering if there's similar lobbying efforts in other fields that are similar to this, um, and we want to know what are the similarities and differences with Fusion Day. Um, it might not be something we could push to the main organizers, but GoFast itself can kind of operate independently. And so if we think there's another method that can improve our uh, work, then we would love to hear. Uh, the other thing, too, is GoFast is continuously uh, trying to um, organize in public engagement. So if you know anyone interested in fusion energy research who wants to hear about it, uh, whether there's you know physicists and engineers or uh, trade schools, community colleges, places where they have welding classes, uh, or just museums, or even you, your friends and your family, um, we would love to put together a presentation and uh, meet and talk. Thanks so much for your great presentation. And yeah, uh, it looks like your email is there. Um, anyone can also answer or put anything in the chat at any point um but yeah so uh we'll if anyone also loses track of Vataru's email you're welcome to email me which i'll include at the end um, but i will go ahead and um, pass it to Raisa, who will go next and talk about water a tale of trickle down inequities go ahead hey, come on. sure no rush Sorry, it's not quite working. Could I have a second, please? Sure, or I could go ahead, uh, we could go to uh, Yuki if you're available. Hi, I can do that. Sure, thanks. Okay. Just gonna share my screen. Okay, can everyone see okay in here, okay? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking today about a few different projects um, that we pursued at the Science Policy Group at UCLA, um, which I'm currently the president of, um, facilitated by funding from NSPN. We really made the money stretch as much as possible. So there was a lot that we embarked on with the funding. Um, so thank you very much. And the first thing that um, that was a topic of interest that really drove some of these projects was understanding urban greening in LA. Um, so as you can see here, there's a picture of palm trees and palm trees are very aesthetic. They're very much associated with Los Angeles. But if you think about it, we are in a um, growing climate um, conundrum and palm trees don't provide very much shade. Um, so that's sort of one example that I think can bring in people to understand um, why the lack of trees in LA and um, more specifically climate hardy and shade bearing trees. And then the second one was a collaboration that we did um, with the organization Black and Chem, which the current president of is also a member of the science policy group here at UCLA. So first, 
we applied to the NSPN Outreach Fund after some of us published a paper on urban greening. Um, we had specifically proposed that uh, funding from um, public safety measures um, be allocated towards um, urban greening. And this was done because, well, this is our proposal because LA County had overwhelmingly voted to approve a measure already um, that had wanted funding from public safety services to go towards um, community investment. And so the oh, one thing I'll say first is that um, the first author on this paper, Zoe, so she was previously president of the policy group at UCLA and she's currently um, a fellow at the California Council on Science and Technology, um, which is a really great professional experience. Um, I'm not sure how many other people here are interested or currently, I guess, in California or from California want to come back. Um, but we're in contact a lot with the CCST. Um, me and my co president are actually going up next week um, to Sacramento to pitch a bill and meet with some of the fellows. Um, so if that's of interest to anyone, I'm happy to be an avenue of communication there. But so the science of this paper was talking about how the how access to nature was influenced um, by a lot of socioeconomic factor um, that was were often the same ones that would also influence things like public safety and that there was a lot of intersectional um, science that was tying um, outcomes together things like education health um, all of these were um, in between factors that would facilitate how well you did um, in education overall quality of life. Um, or your ability to um, stay away from um, the criminal justice criminal justice system. And I know this is a big schematic. Um, our paper is online um, if anyone's interested, and I'm happy to take questions about this after as well. And so after this, um, I was part of a career development workshop as part of the NSPN annual symposium to talk about um, skill development and working on structuring a policy memo. And so that was a really great experience and it made me think a little bit about um, what the goals of writing something like this was, something like this policy memo. So with the grant that we applied to from NSPN um, after, we wanted to really focus on science communication, communication training so that we could our memos and maybe disperse the ideas a little bit more widely into different ranges of audiences. Um, and then also hopefully translate that into some policy um, with local government engagement. For example, we had previously interviewed um, Holly Mitchell. Um, she was previously a California state senator and currently um, on the board of supervisors for LA. And she was someone who had advocated for the measure that I mentioned that would allocate funds away from the um, public safety system towards um, community investment. So, getting a proposal to her hands um, was something that we were interested in figuring out how to do. And in order to do that, we would want to work on our um, communication, communication training. So we weren't just talking to other um, STEM academics who were interested in policy. So for the science communication training, um, first we had the um, founder of this incredible organization called Skype a Scientist, um, which does outreach by connecting scientists to classrooms all over the country. Um, so she gave us a talk called Bringing Empathy into Your Science Communication. That was really enlightening. Um, and the recording is on our website. Um, we had someone come to do a science illustration um, workshop, which is great because, you know, so many people are visual learners, but we don't really have, I think, much skill in communicating science outside of the figures that we submit to academic journals as a default. Um, so this was really enlightening. And then we also had a really cool talk uh, with a physics PhD student at UC Irvine who had done a lot of broader science communication. So she's very present on social media that has gotten her positions on science consulting on TV shows. So she came to talk to us about connecting more broadly publicly. And lastly, for the local government engagement, we put on an event where we hosted um, some of the candidates for the mayoral candidate for the mayoral election um, here in LA. And we had this idea because there was some controversy because there was a really large um, range of people who are vying for this um, for the primary spots for the mayoral candidate. And there's only a few of them getting a lot of attention and being invited to panels to speak. So we invited the um, quote unquote underdogs who are not getting invited to these things and had a really interesting communication 
about science issues and we were asking them things like you know there is there are large parts of LA that have um, less trees than people there are parts of LA that have 10 trees for every person um, as mayor you know what are the avenues that you envision um, to be able to address something like that or like is that even a priority of yours so that recording is online if you're interested and we want to further develop our pathway to be able to um, have relationships with local legislators. So this is a screenshot of our website where we have contact and we made this page where we introduce ourselves, um, kind of try and market ourselves for the different things that we can bring to the table and the things that we've done, including a few different um, uh, election oriented events that we had done before as well. And so I mentioned this because one of the things that we really brought to the table um, was that we could produce research that provides background stem center recommendations for issues in LA County um, or California. And so all these are published in JSPG, which I know has a close relationship with NSPN. So I think this has been a really um, powerful tool in terms of our own professional development and trying to um, connect more broadly with lawmakers about STEM related issues. And then briefly, I'll talk about the scientists on the ballot event that we did in collaboration with Black and Chem. Um, so this was spearheaded by Sammy Minash. She's the president of Black and Chem and also an officer of the science policy group at UCLA. And so her vision, <laughs> my dogs, um, her vision um, was to bring together legislators. <laughs> Sorry. Um, who? Sorry, give me one second. Yeah. Sorry. Um, to bring in legislators who had experience um, in STEM before, so either like through professional um, development or through um, higher degrees, and to talk about their experience becoming legislators or legislative um, influencers, which I'm not sure if that's the greatest term to use. And that recording is also on our website. And yeah, we wanted to make sure that everything we did was accessible um, beyond the participants in real time. And yeah, so all of this was done um, with funding from NSPN. So thank you very much. And I can take questions. Great, thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, we've got time for a quick question, if anyone has one. If not, we can uh, take them at the end. Uh, looks like Richard has a question in the chat. Yeah, that's a great question. That is something that comes up a lot in policy journals and there are really great models of that. Some in the US, mostly in Europe, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware, for LA, this conversation is, um, so they are building more trains in LA and the conversation, I guess in my understanding is interesting because we're hosting the 2028 Olympics. So from what I've been hearing and reading, it seems like everyone is saying, oh, we are, we're hosting the Olympics. Like before that, we wanna make sure that as we have all this influx of tourists coming that we're able to have um, a system in which they're is um, there are alternatives to just driving around. Um, so I've been hearing a lot of that, but 2020 is coming up and I haven't seen a whole lot of progress. So I feel like people had used the Olympics as something that was like a far off um, date to kind of like put off any development, um, but I don't know, we'll see. Like I'm sure a lot of people here I'd heard about like the high speed rail that was gonna go from LA to San Francisco. So um, that is not within my, you know, understanding of what is possible, but I know that there's conversations happening around it. And yeah, I'm definitely gonna be keeping an eye on the progress. Well, thanks so much. Really appreciate your presentation and I'll uh, pass it to Raisa if you're ready. Um, we can also give you a minute to get started if you need that as well. I'm good. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Hi. I'm Aisa. Uh, I'm a, a finishing in my fourth year uh, as a cognitive 
Cognitive neuroscience, PhD student at UC Newman. Um, so I'm just sharing a uh, blog post uh, that I wrote. So in, in 2016, non-native environmentalists from around the world stood with the indigenous leader on the standing rock native American reservation to fight back against the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline, which would have threatened vital resources like water that they rely on. So this is just one example in recent history when the human right um, access to water was jeopardized for a minoritized community. So different states follow different doctrine that dictate how water is distributed to users. Mm. Modes range from purely geography-based to purely seniority-based to some combination of stuff. Mm. These different modes of quote unquote collateral based access put minority populations at a disadvantage. So access to clean water is also tied to community demographics, as is highlighted by this map comparing where toxic people have been detected where there's a higher proportion of racially minoritized population relative to the national average and people's ability or mobility. And so we can go into that a bit more. So, Given the correspondence between the areas where current water table extraction and replenishment dynamics are not sustainable on a human scale, at least. In the distribution of water triggered conflicts in that same period, Water access is an important factor affecting socio political stability. Since water prevalence is expected to get even less regular as climate change progresses, it can be extrapolated that this increased water stress will be coupled with the greater frequency of water triggered conflicts. The US water infrastructure is aging, with some states' systems dating back even to the Civil War era. And there's, there's been some progress with the recent infrastructure bill. But since, since the infrastructure is so um, they're, they're more likely um, given the distribution of the um, more toxic lead pipes, um, they're more likely to leach, leach 
into the drinking water. So as the was the case that the teeth has um, my points prevalence tracks a combination of racial and socioeconomic economic makeup of an area as well as the rate of disease associated with these toxic chemicals. So um, just some ideas where we can go. Um, of course, of course with the Dakota Dakota Access Pipeline there were a lot of a lot of problems with the design. Um, but some aside from improving the efficiency of capture tanking, yeah. improving the efficiency and capture tanking of um, precipitation other grandmother. It's worth considering a redistribution pipeline given that given that some areas of the country are uh, are expected to become drier and others wetter. But but this was this must be done with a diverse executive board, uh, including ecologists and leaders from the American tribes whose land the proposed line would go there uh, in, in order to make it the um, uh, the most useful outputs. So this idea is a full drawback. Um, there, there is also some um, issues with rethinking the mode of distribution rights. Um, given that systemic obstacles make minority population less likely to achieve privileged access to water. Um, there is no, they are not as free to benefit as their non minority counterparts. Hmm. Which is not to say that I think we should prioritize Technologizing a solution to the crisis, but it one more tool in our tool belt to move forward into an equitable and sustainable future. And I'll take any questions. Thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, we've got time for one quick question or we can just wait until the end and, and do questions then. So if anyone has a quick question, please feel free to jump in. Uh, looks like Zoe. Yes, uh, thank you, Rasha, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm wondering, so one of the solutions that you propose is amending water distribution rights. And I'm wondering how optimistic you are about that. Have there been previous attempts to change water distribution rights? Um, because I know they're really old and pretty restrictive. Have there been any successful efforts that you've seen? Um, yeah, I, I can say that. I'm anything close to an expert on that topic. Um, what, what I have seen thus far hasn't, hasn't moved the needle much um, in terms of like um, 
Kini, creating a um, hybrid model between um, riparian and prior appropriation um, models um, into more inclusive um, method. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thanks so much, Risa, for your presentation, uh, informative presentation. And uh, now I'm going to pass it over to Zoe. And Zoe is going to present on uh, UCAP. So this is a framework for systematic PFAS regulation in California's impacted communities. All right, I'm trying to just share presentation screen. Okay, can you guys see that? Yep. Wonderful. So, hello, my name is Zoe Canavis. I'm a rising fifth year PhD candidate in civil and environmental engineering at the University of California, Davis. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a policy proposal a few of my colleagues and I put together, which is entitled UCAP, a framework for systematic PFAPs uh, regulation in California's impacted communities. But before I do that, I will explain to you what PFAPs are, how prevalent they are, and why it's important to regulate them. So per and, gosh, okay, per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, or PFAPs, which is much easier to say, are a class of industrial chemicals with more than 1,400 variations across 200 industries. As one would imagine, chemicals in this huge class have a variety of uses. One major use of PFAPs is in nonstick and waterproof coatings, such as Teflon and pots and pans, uh, waterproof or water-resistant clothing and cosmetics, and even in food wrappings. One particular subclass of PFAPs is also useful as a flame retardant, as its unique chemical structure allows it to snuff out fire's oxygen. The ubiquitous use of PFAPs have led to massive concentrations in chemical plants, military bases, airports, and landfills. And this has in turn uh, resulted in the pollution of nearby environments and most devastatingly water sources. But you may be wondering, well, if PFAPs have so many beneficial applications and uses, what does it matter if some end up in our waterways? Unfortunately, the EPA has found that even at low dose exposure, PFAPs have been linked to many adverse human health impact, impacts, including high cholesterol, ucillative colitis, pregnancy-induced hypertension, thyroid disease, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, decreased response to vaccines, and much more. Additionally, the widespread exposure of PFAPs is staggering. A recent CDC study found that approximately 97% of Americans have at least some amount of PFAPs in their bodies. These adverse health conditions are most prevalent in the nearby fence line communities, which refers to those living adjacent to pollution sources like those chemical plants, military bases, airports, and landfills. Sites with detected PFAPs are shown on the left, Systematic and environmental injustice has resulted in higher densities of minority racial groups and low income households to coincide in these same locations where we are seeing PFAPs contamination. Thus, while fence line communities bear the brunt of PFAPs contamination, they often have little resources to resolve this notoriously difficult to remove contamination. But the dangers of PFAPs is becoming common knowledge thanks to popular media like the weekly satire news show Last Week Tonight with John Oliver and the film Dark Waters, which is a dramatic retelling of the DuPont PFAPs contamination cover-up scandal. This, in turn, with increasing news coverage, has put pressure on the government to protect its people from PFAPs pollution. In response to all of that, there has been both federal and state actions, albeit quite limited. 
At the federal level, the EPA has established health advisory levels of some PFAS in drinking water at 70 parts per trillion, or PPT. Note that the average PFAS blood levels in the U.S. are between um, 1,100 and 4,300 uh, parts per trillion. In addition, health advisory levels are for general guidance and are non-enforceable. In 2021, the EPA released a strategic roadmap in which they expected to establish a national primary drinking water regulation, also called a maximum contaminant level, um, in the coming years. However, a recent Supreme Court decision has limited the regulatory power of the EPA, bringing into question the ability to enforce future regulations. In the absence of a federal MCL, public water utilities are not required to routinely test for PFAS or to treat water exceeding uh, EPA health advisory levels. In turn, no comprehensive assessment of the prevalence of PFAS in the US in drinking water exists. Further, individual states are left to their own device, um, are left on their own to devise their own uh, PFAS regulations without standardized government oversight. Now, in California, PFAS were added to the list of chemicals that are known to the state of California to cause cancer through Proposition uh, 65. California has yet to enact um, has yet to enact a set of drinking water limits for PFAS. Although the Water Resources Control Board has adopted notification and response levels for PFAS. However, an effort to establish an MCL is currently underway. California is arguably the most progressive state in enacting PFAS regulations. Thus far, PFAS have been banned in some products while including, um, while including notifications for others. California is currently a leader in PFAS notification and removal, but there is still more to be done when considering the wide-reaching health effects of PFAS. With that in mind, to address the community-level health concerns of PFAS exposure and develop more effective technologies to remove PFAS from water sources, we propose that the California legislator allocate $4 million to create the University Community Alliance to address PFAS, also called UCAP. UCAP will pair fenceline communities with PFAS researchers from public universities in California to one, educate the community about the impacts of contact with PFAS, two, study and assess the extent of the community's exposure and to conduct pilot removal projects. UCAP will focus on fenceline communities because they are most affected by PFAPS contamination and are historically underserved. Many public universities in California are already conducting PFAPS research, including UC Davis, Berkeley, San Francisco, Irvine, Merced, and Riverside. Expanding the focus of these research groups to include community level impacts and improvement will rapidly progress PFAPS contamination detection and remediation technologies. Allocated funding for UCAP from the California legislature will demonstrate California's commitment to protecting vulnerable populations from PFAPS. And before I close, I want to thank my collaborators for this project, uh, Omanjana from the Center of Food Safety in Washington, DC, Ali from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and Raisha and Richard, both fellow graduate students at UC Davis. And with that, I'll take any questions if there's time. Thank you. Yeah, we've got a few minutes. Uh, we've got some time. So if anyone has a few questions, um, maybe just one, and then we'll save the rest for later. Okay, no questions so far, but if anyone has anything, please feel free to put it in the chat and then Zoe, you could address it at any point or we could just get to it at the end. Um, but thanks so much for your great presentation. Uh, and next, we're gonna go ahead and move on to John Judd, who can't be here. Uh, John is a second year Gen X PhD at Stanford University and researches the genetic epidemiology of prostate cancer. Uh, so John's 
recorded presentation is on reducing the unemployment rate of formerly incarcerated people through green jobs. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm John Judd. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for NSPN for inviting me to talk to you all. I am going to be talking a little bit about um, a op-ed I am writing with Eleanor Wang on reducing the unemployment rate of formerly incarcerated people through green jobs. So starting off on the effects of incarceration, the United States incarcerated population has skyrocketed. In 1972, the U.S. state and federal prison population was only about 196,000 people. This is, of course, a lot. However, as of 2020, 1.8 million people were incarcerated in the United States, and the incarceration rate was about 358 per 100,000 residents, which is the highest in the world. Actually, this the number of people incarcerated actually decreased from 2.1 million um, prior to the pandemic, and this decrease is largely due to public policy to decrease population in order to decrease spread. And you've probably seen this figure on the right-hand side on the lifetime likelihood of imprisonment for U.S. residents. For men, one in nine men will be incarcerated, and for women, one in 56. Meaning if you're in a room with 10 men, likely, one of them has been incarcerated. Well, something that makes this large po incarcerated population worse is that Formerly incarcerated people are unemployed at a significantly higher rate than the general public. If you look at this plot put together by the Prison Policy Initiative with time on the x-axis, unemployment on the right or on the left, the unemployment rate between the United States um, peaked in the Great Depression at 25%. This quickly dropped and stayed steady. And if we go all the way to 2008, the unemployment rate for the general public was around 5%. However, at the same time, the employment unemployment rate for formerly incarcerated people was 27%, higher than even during the Great Depression. Unfortunately, the difference in these unemployment rates and lifetime earnings has only increased. Unemployment rate as of June 2022, the general public was 3.5%. And while it's difficult to measure the unemployment rate of formerly incarcerated people, it's believed to be even greater than the previous measure um, at 27%. And a 2021 Bureau of Labor Statistics study found that formerly incarcerated people were earning less than 84% of the general public even four years after release. On the right hand side, you can see that four years post release, formerly incarcerated people were only earning around six, 400. And $60 weekly compared to the 550 earned by the general public. All of this builds into increase in poverty for those who are formerly incarcerated. And a 2017 SAM HSA survey found that poverty is one of the strongest predictors of recidivism. So you have unemployment, leads to poverty, leads to recidivism. And this is seen on the plot on the right hand side, this is essentially the number of times people were arrested, for, arrested and booked in the past 12 months, and then the percent of that population that has an annual income below 10,000. One of the striking things effects here is that for this column right here, of all people with two plus arrests in the past month, about half of them had an annual income below 10,000. So obviously, this is a major issue. Um, splitting onto a tangent that will become relevant soon enough is green jobs and climate change. So, climate change obviously I don't poses an existential economic threat to the United States and the world. WHO expects that between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause an additional 250,000 deaths per year, and that climate change could cost more than 209 billion a year due to natural disasters and effects of health. We're already kind of seeing these effects around the world today, as you're seeing through massive heat waves that are seen across the world, which are increasing deaths and increasing economic downfall. Many governments in the United States have reacted to this through an increased focus on green jobs. The Bureau of Labor Statistics defines green jobs as those that produce 
goods and services that benefit the environment or involve making a product or service more environmentally friendly. This includes, but is not limited to, agriculture, renewable energy, and firefighting. I'm going to bring up firefighting a bit throughout this, a little later on. And one way that U.S. government has reacted to increasing green jobs is through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Some of the major focuses in this act is an investment in passenger rail and cre creating a network of electric vehicle chargers, resilient infrastructure, and investments in environmental remediation. Um, all of these aim to create jobs that hopefully help fix the climate and the environment. So now that I've talked about both recidivism as well as climate change, there's actually a possible solution that could act on both these problems. This can be done by increasing funding for green jobs that is specifically extended to training and employment of formerly incarcerated people. I previously talked about the Infrastructure, infrastructure and Investment Act, but exa other examples of green jobs that formerly incarcerated people can get training include construction organization, public transportation, and firefighting. And funding could also extend past these traditionally low skilled jobs into computer aided design and computer coding. Existing funding that already exists for training of formerly incarcerated people that's not in green jobs. Specifically in California, these high road construction careers and these high road training partnerships. As I said, they're specifically targeting job training and they could be redirected towards specifically funding and training for jobs. A model for this is the CAL FIRE Conservation Camp Program and AB 2147. So since 1946, the CAL FIRE Conservation Camp Program has trained and employed incarcerated people as firefighters. In 2017, the incarcerated firefighters actually made up 30% of California's firefighting workforce. And then in 2020, AB 2147 is a law that enabled these incarcerated firefighters to continue to be employed as firefighters after release. Before this law, this wasn't possible because you cannot get a state license as an EMT in California um, when you are incarcerated. However, even though this is now a possibility, there are still many issues with this conservation camp program and AB 2147, as noted in this article on the right-hand side from the Atlantic. So while it is not a perfect program, it is definitely a model that we discuss in our op-ed. So as everything um, I talk about today, we definitely talk about more in the op-ed. So hopefully when that is released, you all give that a look. If you have any questions or feedback or want to talk about anything I talked about here, feel free to reach out at my email below and thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, so now we're going to go to the conclusion and Chris is going to share a slide with our email addresses in case anyone has any comments, suggestions, questions, um, both people here tonight and anyone who looks at the recording. Um, and I wanted to also just take the time to appreciate everyone who attended, um, asked questions, everyone who spoke. A sincere thank you for your wonderful presentations. Um, we're going to be sending out the recording to all speakers and attendees, and this is also going to be posted publicly on NSPN's channels such as YouTube or other relevant platforms. It will be posted um, hopefully pretty widely. Uh, we'll also be doing a blog post write up of this event. And additionally, if you're interested in participating in the future, we're hoping this to do this again, or if you'd like to participate again, um, this will be sometime in the near future. Uh, and then, of course, finally, via these email addresses, please feel free to reach out. Uh, there's also potentially opportunities to be involved with uh, any of these projects, uh, just depending upon the situation or especially when it comes to anything related to chapters or efforts in those areas. Um, so if anyone would like to stay on, we can break out into quick breakout rooms, just ask a few remaining questions. Um, and yeah, and Chris will take care of that section. But thanks again, everyone. <laughs>